This is the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session, a weekly recap of your 2023 Phillies. Broadcasting live from Chickies and Pete's. Tonight's show is brought to you by Team Toyota, BCWSA, Fogo de Show, Independence Blue Cross, and Capital Grill. Now, here are your hosts, Phillies PA announcer Dan Baker and Mickey Morandini. Welcome to another edition of the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session, live from Chickie and Pete's in Glassboro, New Jersey. Our special co-host today, the outstanding second baseman for the Philadelphia Phillies, Mickey Morandini, and our special guest, one of the best pinch hitters to come down the pike, Milt Thompson. Milt, how, Milt, Mickey, how are you guys doing today? All good. Doing good, doing good. It's going to be interesting with the Phillies. They've got, they split with the Braves. Now they go to the Mets and the Nationals, and the Nationals are not a, a walk in the park, are they? Not anymore. I thought they were going to be bad again this yeah. year, but they're playing some pretty good ball. Marlins are playing excellent baseball. They're over 500, but uh, we got our work cut out for us. We, uh, you know, I, I've been th thinking about the Phillies, and we're only a couple games better than we were last year at this time, and, and you know, getting Turner and revamping that bullpen like they did and bringing in Walker, full year of Marsh, full years for Stott and Bohm. I mean, I really thought that they'd be a little farther ahead in where they're at. So I got some concerns. I'm not going to lie. What's your biggest concern, Milt, with this team? Hitting with runners in scoring position. Well, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's been really tough this year. Has <laughs> that become a mental thing? Both you guys have had that situation throughout your career. Does it become a mental thing? And does it you know, go down through the lineup? The guys start pressing a little bit when men on scoring position? I think the game has changed. You know, guys are they're trying to get the ball in the air, hit more home runs. And, and in, in that situation, I just look at work in the middle of the field. You know, if I hit a ground ball to second or short, less than two outs with the infield back, that guy's going to score from third base. So it's just the, the approach of how you want to try to put the ball in play and get that guy in. Why is the approach different today, Mickey, than it was when you broke into baseball, when Milk broke into baseball? I mean, the two-strike approach is, is gone, completely gone. A few guys like Bryson Stott, uh, they know how to hit with two strikes. But most guys can't. Why is it? Is it because it's velocity, uh, exit velocity, uh, all that stuff? I mean, I think we really ruined a lot of good hitters. Well, I think it's analytics came in and said strikeouts are okay. And hitters started not worrying about striking out. They were, you know, this OPS thing that everybody's concerned with it became really popular. And I remember the, the third baseman, Bregman, from Houston, and said, I don't care what my average is. I'd wanna, I want a good OPS. You know, he could hit 220 and have, you know, be able to hit doubles and home runs and things like that. He didn't care what his average was. And the RBI isn't as important as it used to be either. Stolen base isn't. There's a lot of things in the game now that aren't as important as they used to be. And for me, that's what makes the game a little bit more boring now. And, and, and you can see they're trying to make it a little more exciting by making the bases bigger and doing different things and eliminating the shift. So um, it's just a combination of things, but people don't care if they strike out anymore. No, you were a hitting instructor. What have they done to hitters today? Have they changed their approach to the game? I mean, when you come up, you want to put the ball in play. The more times you put the ball in play, the better off you are of getting on base. But it seems like that, that's not important to these people today. Well, I think they get too much information. <laughs> all the analytics, all these things. Uh, uh, right before I got out of the game, you know, I was running the minor leagues. I was a hitting coordinator. And they would come up to me and go, this guy throws a slider 64.3% one, one, of the time. What does that mean to me? <laughs> you know what I mean? I got to be ready to hit a fastball and adjust from there. It's all about approaching what you're trying to do. I think uh, we watch the game now, and you, you see a guy get two strikes on him and take a fastball right down the middle. You're like, oh, my God, how did he take that? Well, he was looking for an off-speed pitch, and I don't know anybody who's good enough to hit a fastball <laughs> when they're looking off-speed, when yeah. they're thinking off-speed. Here's the, here's the mentality of young players now because of analytics and exit velocity. I asked a high school I, I talked to a high school team about a month ago, and I asked a kid, I said, would you rather hit a 100-mile-an-hour line drive at the second baseman for an out 
Or would you rather hit a little blooper over the shortstop's head that probably went about 60 miles an hour for a base hit? You know what he said? I'd rather hit a hard ground or hard line drive for an out. That's the mentality. That's what analytics and exit velocity and launch angle and all this is teaching our youth about hitting. That's a mistake. That really the, – the, the game was – you know, I, I was looking up some statistics the other day. How many times do you think Babe Ruth struck out in a season? A hundred times in his career, Babe Ruth. Well, well look once. at Tony Gwynn. And, and, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> never. Ted Williams never struck no. out a hundred times. These, now, of course, these are arguably – you talk about Tony Gwynn. Oh. He was a master. I mean, 338 lifetime batting average. That's not going to happen in this day and age. I think they said Smoltz, Glavin, Maddox, and Pedro Martinez faced Gwynn like over 330 times in their career. He struck out three times against them. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? I, I mean, I think we're, we have to get back to some of the basics that you guys were taught when you were coming up through the minor league. Look what they did to Scott Kingery. They changed his approach. They changed his stance and everything. This guy's struggling to stay on a minor league roster, right? Well, that was a Scott Kingery decision. He, uh, hired, a, he hired a hitting coach outside of the Phillies, and that hitting coach taught him you know, try and hit home runs. You know, I guess him in the minor leagues hitting singles and doubles and stealing bases and hitting 320 wasn't enough. So he got to the big leagues, popped a couple homers. Hey, let's go for home runs now. And you're right, it ruined his career. I mean, it, it's just amazing because when you guys came up, as I said, you know, that wasn't prehistoric times. Obviously, when you struck out, you guys were embarrassed, right, Mill? Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, the reason we had success is because I used the whole field. And also, I laid down bunts. I, when I worked with kids in the minor leagues, I said, you know what? Five bunt hits a, a month will get you 20, 20, 20 extra hits, buddy. You will love that, you know? But these guys, they don't if – I, if I try to bunt and it's a bet, you know, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm wasting it at bat. No. Because when we came up, the first thing we did is we looked and we saw where the infielders were playing. If you're playing back, I'm going to take the bunt. But what I do, it's a chess match because now they know I can bunt, so they might take a couple more steps in. Now I can hit a ball by you. So it's a chess match when, when we were playing. You know, right now, nobody even thinks about bunting. You know, I applauded the other day when Garrett Stubbs laid that, down that bunt. Remember that? When he laid it down? I couldn't believe it. I, I thought, man, this guy's a thinking man's player. And then Harper does it every once in a while. More guys should do that. As you said, it'll bring the infielders in a little bit. I don't know if Harper Button's going to bring the infielder in a little <laughs> bit, but in the situation where you're down two or three or four runs and his, you know, his at-bat really doesn't mean a whole lot, absolutely get on base and try and create some runs. And he did that the other day. He got on base. I think the next guy walked, and then somebody singled him home, and they got within a run. Uh, but, uh, yeah, guys don't want to bunt. They don't want to waste at bats, I guess. Well, they think they're wasting at bat. What do you do with Schwarber right now? He's hitting 105 in the last 25 games. 105. I mean, if, if you were 20 years ago, if you were hitting 105 over 25 games, you'd have your bags packed and back to the minors. Am I right, guys? <laughs> Pretty good chance. Yep, but that's not going to happen today. <laughs> ain't going to happen. Um, he had a little success leading off. Maybe I, I'd put him in the leadoff spot for a little while and have him be a little more aggressive. That's, that's one option right now. What would you do, Mickey? I mean, you've got to keep him in the lineup. I mean, he yeah. can pop a pitch out of the ballpark, and, and, you know, he's got 13 home runs, so he's, he's hitting the ball out of the ballpark. He just – he either strikes out walks or hits home runs, and, you know, um, the, the thing that really concerns me with this team is this team was built to hit home runs, and I saw a stat yesterday. They were fourth fewest home runs in May. So if this team's not hitting home runs, and we've seen it, they're not going to score a lot of runs because they don't manufacture a lot of runs. So it's a little concerning, but it is going to start getting hot out, and the balls are going to start flying out of CBP, so hopefully we can turn that around. Are you concerned about the starting pitching, both you guys? I am. Uh, it's been two years. We still don't have a number five starter on this team. It's, it's, <laughs> I don't understand that, but... Uh, you know, it was, it was encouraging. Nola had a good outing, and Wheeler had his best outing of the year. Walker's pitched better his last two outings. we got to get um, Ranger going. But uh, that fifth spot, I don't understand how a big league ball club cannot have a, 
a number five starter. That doesn't make any sense to me. You know, you, you talk about Wheeler the other day. He pitched very, very solid baseball. Why they took him out in the ninth inning? I, I didn't understand that. Why? I mean, he, he was cruising through the lineup. Why would you take him out? I mean, he had you, 106 you pitches. Oh wow! Gee, <laughs> <laughs> I guess his arm's gonna fall off. <laughs> I he mean, didn't want to come out. I know that. Y- yeah. You could see he was a little upset about yeah. the manager and the pitching coach. I mean, that, that's, that amazes me. The guy was just cruising through the lineup. Why would you bring Kimbrell in? I didn't understand that. It's today's baseball. That's, yeah, that's, it's today's baseball, today. you know. Um, we, we've seen it in the past years. You look at uh, Snell when he was with Tampa Bay. He was carving the Dodgers up. Oh, and they yeah. took him out, and, and, and season, yeah, and yeah. they took him out, and I could read Mookie Betts' lips. Oh my God! Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you know, and then last year with the Dodgers, Anderson in the playoffs against San Diego, he was cruising. And they just go back to what they they do all year. You know, that feel of this guy can go only, only see the guys that third time through the lineup's trouble. Now we can't let you do that, <laughs> regardless yeah. of how I'm throwing. But you guys face some of the best pitchers around. You face the Glavins, the, the, the Maddoxes, people like that. Didn't those pitchers get stronger as the game went on? I know Steve Carlton got stronger. I know a lot of great pitchers got stronger as the game went on. Well, that was the key, you know, especially when you, when you face Glavin. You got to get to him early because he got into a groove and then he started, you know, he carving people up. So he was a, he was a pitcher who you had to get to early in the game because he got stronger and got better as, as the game went along. You know, not like he was throwing harder or anything, but he was like painting, you know, where he wanted to throw the ball and stuff after he got, you know, warmed up a little bit. Well, and we groom these guys in the minor leagues now to pitch five innings. I mean, how many guys do you see in the minor leagues going seven, eight, nine, eight? You, you don't see it anymore. They get to the five innings, they get to the 70, 80 pitches, and they're pulled. So how can we expect them – to get to the big leagues and all of a sudden they're going to throw 110, 100, 120 pitches. It's not going to happen. They don't have the mentality that the Carltons and the Schillings and the Pedro Martinez and all those great pitchers had. When they took the ball, they wanted to complete the game. Pitchers don't have that mentality today. You know what bothers the heck out of me? They have the pitch count up on the scoreboard. If I owned a club, that pitch, clock, pitch count would come down. Because pitchers will look up and say, oh, I must be getting tired. I've thrown 75 pitches. I mean, that's the mentality today. Well, the thing is, we've already told them that 100 is the, is the number. Right. right. 100 pitches is the number. That's what we've ingrained in their heads, you know. And the sad part is, you look at it, some guys get 100 pitches in four or five innings, you know. And that's, what happened, that's what's happened to the game. Now, when you guys are coming through the minor leagues, they do de- they taught pitching, how to pitch inside, outside, you know, work the plate. But today, it seems like the philosophy is throw as hard as you can for as long as you can. I think that's not teaching the, the art of pitching. You agree? That's why Maddox was so unbelievable. I faced him in Chicago. He was grunting, throwing 93, getting beat. <laughs> he goes over to Atlanta. He dials it back a couple miles an hour and just was an artist. You know, this guy, I can't tell you how many times this guy got a complete game with 90 pitches. Mm. Complete game with 90 pitches. That's unheard of. They, nobody today would ever go, what? 90 or less. I mean, they had on that staff, they didn't have any other than Smoltz who threw hard, but he wasn't like yeah. 98, 99. Clavin wasn't a hard, you know, he didn't throw that hard. Maddox didn't throw that hard. Nagel didn't throw that hard. Avery? Avery didn't throw that hard. Lebrand, you know, he was a p- puff thrower, so they knew how to pitch. That's why they won ball games. What about the amount of people in the game of baseball that don't have a baseball background? Mm. That bothers me an <laughs> awful lot, guys. I'm we sorry. Gotta, we got to lead. Huh? <laughs> we can't touch that one too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm not going to get you in trouble. I, I'm not getting anybody in trouble because it, it just, it just it, it, from my standpoint, it really it bothers me to a certain extent because I look at, like, I'm friendly with Bruce Bochy, and I talk to him a lot about baseball. And you look at his staff, a lot of – Ex major leaguers on his staff, but I mean, it, it bothers me because that they know the ropes. 
and I don't know. It's just it, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, I mean they just they don't know what a player goes through, especially the the mind part of it. You know, the physical part you can kind of see on the field what they go through, but the the mental part of it, guys that never played a game have no idea what players go through in the mental side of it. None. You know, you, you look at this club right now, and you mentioned about starting pitching. I mean, when do you think Painter will be up, or do you think they'll shut him down for the entire year, Mickey? And I don't Milton? think they'll shut him down the entire year. I, but they're going to they're gonna go as slow as they can with this kid. I mean, he's only 20 years old. I understand that. Yeah. Um, I know he's – I think he's throwing from 50 or 60 feet right now. I don't even know if he's throwing on a mound yet. We may see him throwing – I don't know, August maybe, something like that, and get a handful of starts. Will it be in the big leagues? I don't know. But they're going to take their time with him. I, I look at, you know, clubs like the Cubs. Look at a guy like Marcus Stroman. Now, it's going to cost you a little bit to get him. On. The Cubs aren't going anywhere. Or look at the Royals roster. They're not going anywhere. The Oakland A's aren't going anywhere in a hurry. I mean, I think you have to make a trade now for another starting pitcher because you can't fall eight, nine, ten games behind the Braves and hope you catch lightning in the bottle. Well, I know Stroman pitched a complete game today, so he's pitching pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think they're going to have to do something uh, with that fifth starter spot. They can't throw out the guys that they're throwing out there now and expect to win ball games. Um, you're asking too much of Nola and, and Wheeler, you know, when you, when you have a fifth starter. And then your bullpen, you know, they end up throwing six or seven innings in the ball game, and then you don't have a bullpen left. I'm a little concerned with the bull. I mean, they're yeah. throwing a boatload of innings, boatload of innings, and we need these starters to go a little bit deeper, a little bit more consistently. Well, that's what happened last year. We were doing – we were having bullpen start games, yeah. you know, and it, it, it killed the bullpen at the end of the year. And Absolutely. You can't, you can't get, continue to – to, to have those guys going out there every other day just throwing early in the season. It's going to catch up with you. Soto, I think we're not even into June yet. Soto, I think, has 26 appearances already. That's wow. a lot of appearances for Lever and May. No April question. May. Gentlemen, we have to take a quick break here on the Independence Blue Cross Pool Session, live from Chickie and Pete in Glassboro, New Jersey. Our great producer, Chris Armour, is right there at the controls. So he's tapped me on the shoulder. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right, right back. At Independence Blue Cross, we believe in giving you the tools you need to pursue your healthiest life. From premiums as low as $0 per month to health discounts and cash rewards, it pays to have coverage with Independence. With the strongest network of doctors and hospitals in the region and free 24-7 virtual doctor visits, you can feel confident that quality care is always within reach. Learn more about your coverage options at ibx.com. If you're looking for a stylish and sophisticated fine dining experience, visit your Eddie V's Prime Seafood Restaurant in near King of Prussia. Eddie V's Seafood features an abundant selection of fine wines and curated cocktails to complement exquisite steaks and seafood made from the highest quality ingredients. In the V Lounge, sip on imaginative handcrafted cocktails with attitude while enjoying signature appetizers. Conveniently located between I-276 and I-76 near the King of Prussia Mall. Call them today, 610-337-7823 to schedule your night out for Eddie V's Prime Prime Seafood. A truly unique dining experience awaits you at Fogo de Show. Fogo de Show awes patrons with their history and tradition of authentic Brazilian steakhouse, offering many cuts of decadent fire roasted meats prepared over an open fire and served tableside by trained gaucho chefs. Fogo de Show, 1337 Chestnut Street in Center City, Philadelphia. For reservations, go to www.fogo.com or call 215 636 9700. SEPTA offers a variety of career opportunities. Our core business is transit, and with five modes of service, we rely on and need operators, engineers, and conductors. But it takes a host of other specialties, including mechanics, electricians, plumbers, masons, painters, carpenters, welders, and more to keep the system moving. As an employee, you will earn competitive compensation and great benefits, including medical, dental, prescription, and a pension. Visit jobs.septa.org to apply today. That's jobs.septa.org. During the Toyota Ready, Set, Go sales event, just imagine yourself in a new Toyota. Whatever you need, from an electric vehicle to a rugged, versatile truck, we have new Toyotas on the ground for immediate delivery. Or choose from over 100 certified used options, which undergo a rigorous inspection and include an amazing warranty. Plus service centers that can save you time and money and keep you on the road. So let's go to Team Toyota this spring. 
Just visit teamtoyota.net to find a location near you. We now return to the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session. Once again, here are your hosts, Phillies PA announcer Dan Baker and Mickey Morandini. We are back. I'm Bill Werndell, pinch hitting for the great Dan Baker. Our special guest today, Milt Thompson, my great co-host today, <laughs> Mickey Morandini. We're live here at Chickies and Pete's in Glassboro on the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session. And gentlemen, the Phillies have got to get it going right now. I mean, it, it, you can't keep, you know, playing 500 ball. You you got to make a step in the right direction. You got the Mets and the Nationals. You got to take four to six games. You agree, yeah, gentlemen? Well, the the thing is, you can't think about yet last year. Oh, we we you know we came back last we came back last year. That's last year. You know, we got to we got to put the foot on the metal and get started here and uh, start winning some ball games and getting things going. Yeah, it's just, you know, just when you think they're going to take off, you know, they win two or three in a row. They play, you know, they get good starting pitching. They put the ball in play. They hit some home runs. All of a sudden they throw up a couple stinkers and and you start feeling bad about the team again. But, yeah, they got to they got to get on a roll here. Um, and this is a good place to start with, you know, going up to New York and Washington, division games. You don't play as many division games now, so they're going to mean something. And then you can come home for a, a pretty good homestand and, uh, you know, get on a roll here, get above 500 and start uh, gaining some ground. You know, you, you look at their defense right now. That, that has not been up to snuff, I don't think. I mean, Turner yesterday made that error in the field. Schwerber bobbled one. I think that's another key component. This club's got to tighten it up. Do you agree, Mickey? Well, yeah, you always want to play good defense. Um, we haven't been really good defensively for a while now. We weren't good defensively last year. Um, but, uh, you know, I thought Turner coming in here would solidify things a little bit better. But he struggled a little bit. I think he's got seven or eight errors already. Um, and, you know, the corner guys in the outfield, Castellanos actually has been okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marsh is off the charts. He's a great center fielder. But, yeah, we got we got to tighten up a lot of things. The base running has made a lot of mistakes uncharacteristically because they were really good base runners last year. Um, we just we just got to put everything together here, and I think we got to do it pretty quickly. All right. You guys went to spring training with some real old-school managers, and I guess they stressed fundamentals in spring training, and they jumped all over you if you made bonehead mistakes, didn't they? We had somebody named John Vukovic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Larry Boa. And Larry Boa. Yeah, you're not, right. you're, nothing's going to get by these guys. So right. it's in, it's, it was um, very important. You know, every day we had a fundamental we were working on, and we didn't get to hit until we got it right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's a lack of effort. I mean, I think they work. I, I see them out there, you know, working on their infield play and outfield play every day in pregame like we always mm -hmm. did. I don't think it's that. It's just uh, – you know, they're just not really good defensive players. Schwarber's more of a DH. Castellanos is more of a DH. You know, Stott's done a great job at second base. I'm telling you right now, it's not easy to go from shortstop to second base without a lot of games under your belt, and he's done a great job there. You know, Bohm's starting to learn first base. He's doing a pretty good job over there. Um, you know, Sosa's an okay defensive player, but he's not an everyday type of guy. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, we got to get the pitching and the defense going and start Hitting that ball out of the ballpark. All right, you mentioned Bone. Is it good to keep bouncing him back between first and third, third and first? Is that a good idea? Because he was starting to come on as a third baseman. I don't see an issue with it. I really don't. Um, your defense where you're playing really should not affect your offense at all. Um, I like what Alex's doing. He's still hitting the ball the other way, He's starting to show a little bit more pop, you know, with the home runs. Um, the way him, Marsh, and if you told me him, Marsh, and Stott are playing the way they're playing, I would say they're probably 10 games over 500. And it's just, you know, the Turners and the yeah. Schwarbers and those guys that just haven't lived up to what, what we're used to right now. Nope. Well, I just think that, you know, you were talking about the errors. You know, when you give teams extra outs, it comes back to haunt you. So that's why it's very important to clean that up. And as, as far as those young kids, man, I'm, I'm very impressed. I mean, Stock gives you an outstanding at bat every single time. Uh, Bohm has a, a very good approach. I saw those guys down in spring training in Clearwater, and I was talking to them. I said, man, I like how you guys have improved in your approach to the game. Like, you're going to be very successful if you stay right there. 
And that's very important. Know, uh, what was that thing I always heard? Know thyself. <laughs> know what your strengths are, what you need to do to be successful. You know what bothers me the most? I hear people say, well, you got to get 25 home runs out of bone at third base. I'm saying, wait a minute. If he hits 290, hits 18 home runs, and drives in 90 runs, that, that's a damn good season for anybody. Well, let me just say this. In 2008, we had a third baseman named Pedro Feliz. His hits were in his glove. Right. <laughs> and then the, the, you had Utley at, at second base giving you third base numbers. So, you know, wherever it is on your field, everybody has to do their job, you know. We, we knew Pedro was going to come up with clutch hits, but we knew anything hit down there, he was going to gobble it up. There was nothing that's going to get by him. And that's very important. You know, what, what I like about Bohm is, you know, he uses the entire field. And with Turner struggling right now, maybe you drop Turner down in the order and maybe had Stott and Bohm back-to-back at the top of the order. Is that too radical right now? It is right now because Schwarber's struggling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you got to keep Bohm down in that area right there, you know, right. in, in the middle of the lineup to, to come up with those, those big hits for us that he's been doing all year. I don't know if moving guys around in the batting order really makes a difference. I mean, if you were struggling in the two-hole and then on one day you're in the eight-hole, <laughs> you know, it's not a magic potion where all of a sudden you're going to start hitting. I, I don't know if that has an effect on guys as much as people think they do. And you say, well, you know, he's going to hit in the eight-hole. It's not as important. Well, he might just come up with the five, six, seven guys on base, <laughs> and now he's in the eight-hole and he's, he ne- we need a hit out of him. So I'm not big on, you know, moving guys down to get him going. And I don't think that's a really effective way to do it. Did you guys have a place in the order you felt comfortable with? Where did you like to bat most? I liked hitting second in the two spot because Lenny was always on base. So right. I saw a lot of fastballs, you know. He'd steal some bases. I was good at moving runners. I could bunt them over. I could pull the ball if I had to. Um, I could steal a base if I had to. I just liked that two spot. I, I could create some things. and. Um, I had my best year in Chicago with the Cubs when Sammy Sosa was hitting behind me. Oh, really? Because I saw nothing but fastballs because they sure want, didn't want, you know, they wanted to get me out because they sure didn't want to have to face Sammy. So uh, I don't know where Milt was comfortable, but. I was either for, uh, first or second. I remember when I, first, when, I first, at the, when I first got to the big leagues, I was leading off. And then when I came over to Philly, Juan, Juan Samuel was hitting first. I was batting second. So, and, uh, you know, we had this thing where you got to strike to steal a base. Yeah. You know, I'm taking pitches till you steal that base. If it, ball, I'm not swinging. And, you know, just little things like that, just confidence things. Like Mickey said, when you got that hole open right there, it's a, it's a bonus when you're a left-handed hitter. So you just take advantage of that. Yeah. You, you talk about stolen bases. They enlarge the bases. You only can throw over twice. I, I, I would think there would be a lot more stolen bases. I know the numbers are up, but not that dramatically. I, it's a home run league. <laughs> yeah. oh, man. Still got to get on base. Yeah. <laughs> they got to get on base. To steal. Like I thought, Trey Turner would have about thirty steals by now. Right. He's got seven, I think. Right. It's, he's not getting on base, so you got to get on base. I think our, our you know, we're still on bases. Um, you know, Real Muto's got a handful. Stott's got a handful. You know, Harper's probably got a few in there, but. We're not a really a base stealing team. We're a power team. We're, we're supposed to hit home runs. We're supposed to hit the ball at the ballpark. You have to shut down the power, as you guys alluded to earlier. You've got to manufacture runs. Right. And, and I don't know if this club at, right now at this point is, is capable of manufacturing runs. Well, it's just a, it's a struggle. You know, it's just like, you know, it's contagious. <laughs> you know, guys are struggling with guys in, score, in scoring position, and it's contagious, you know, because now you're putting extra pressure on yourself to try to get the job done instead of just relaxing and say, you know what, it's like nobody's on. Get, get your approach, hit the ball, get the ball up the middle of the field, and, and good things will happen, especially now that there's no shifts, you know. And the one thing that's not dropping in numbers is strikeouts. The strikeouts – across the board are still the same as they've been the last two years. And it's funny. It was amazing how we thought that, you know, no shift Schwarber would be so much better. Yeah, yeah that's the amazing part about it. I mean, he, he still pulls everything. I mean, you'd think he would be able to use some of the field. I mean, you know, it seems like he always pull happy. I mean, you do have to use the entire field at times when the pitch is on the outside part of the plate, right? Well, 
I, I know it's the same. Mickey has the same, same mindset I had when we were playing. I'm going to take the fastball up the middle. If I'm a little early, I'm good. If I'm a little late, I'm good. Right. But if I'm trying to pull everything and then I get off speed stuff, good luck. Right. <laughs> yeah, and he just, you know, he should be a, a hitter that can hit home runs the other way. You know, Ryan Howard hit a lot of balls the other way for home right. runs. Um, and Schwarber should be able to do that. But you're right. Most of his home runs are – and when he gets it, he gets it. He they go a long does. way. But uh, he, most of his home runs are pool home runs. All right. Turner signs that mega deal. I mean, uh, over $300 million. Do you think he's pressing? I mean, he heard the Boo Birds last week. Of course, he, he acquired them when he hit that home run in the ninth inning and the Phillies won uh, the last game of the Diamondback series. Do you think Turner is pressing right now? I mean, I'm sure that's part of it. I think when he went into the WBC and cranked out about six homers in about nine games or whatever it was, I just think he's starting to uppercut a little bit. I think that's part of his swing now is home runs. And I looked at his numbers. One year I think he hit 25 in 2021, and last year maybe hit 22 home. But by no means is Trey Turner a power hitter. He's, he needs to hit ground balls, line drives, use that speed, steal some bases. And uh, we're just not seeing that for him. He could get he sh he should get 40 infield hits a year with as fast as he is, and that includes bunts too. Yep. All right, we got to take a quick break. Our special guest is Milt Thompson. Our special co-host is Mickey Morandini. We're here at Chickie and Pete's in Glassboro, New Jersey. You're listening to the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session. I'm Bill Werndell, and we'll be right back. At Independence Blue Cross, we believe in giving you the tools you need to pursue your healthiest life. From premiums as low as $0 per month to health discounts and cash rewards, it pays to have coverage with Independence. With the strongest network of doctors and hospitals in the region and free 24-7 virtual doctor visits, you can feel confident that quality care is always within reach. Learn more about your coverage options at ibx.com. If you're looking for a stylish and sophisticated fine dining experience, visit your Eddie V's Prime Seafood Restaurant in near King of Prussia. Eddie V's Seafood features an abundant selection of fine wines and curated cocktails to complement exquisite steaks and seafood made from the highest quality ingredients. In the V Lounge, sip on imaginative handcrafted cocktails with attitude while enjoying signature appetizers. Conveniently located between I-276 and I-76 near the King of Prussia Mall. Call them today, 610-337-7823 to schedule your night out for Eddie V's Prime Prime Seafood. A truly unique dining experience awaits you at Fogo de Show. Fogo de Show awes patrons with their history and tradition of authentic Brazilian steakhouse, offering many cuts of decadent fire roasted meats prepared over an open fire and served tableside by trained gaucho chefs. Fogo de Show, 1337 Chestnut Street in Center City, Philadelphia. For reservations, go to www.fogo.com or call 215 636 9700. SEPTA offers a variety of career opportunities. Our core business is transit, and with five modes of service, we rely on and need operators, engineers, and conductors. But it takes a host of other specialties, including mechanics, electricians, plumbers, masons, painters, carpenters, welders, and more to keep the system moving. As an employee, you will earn competitive compensation and great benefits, including medical, dental, prescription, and a pension. Visit jobs.septa.org to apply today. That's jobs.septa.org. During the Toyota Ready, Set, Go sales event, just imagine yourself in a new Toyota. Whatever you need, from an electric vehicle to a rugged, versatile truck, we have new Toyotas on the ground for immediate delivery. Or choose from over 100 certified used options, which undergo a rigorous inspection and include an amazing warranty. Plus service centers that can save you time and money and keep you on the road. So let's go to Team Toyota this spring. Just visit teamtoyota.net to find a location near you. We now return to the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session. Once again, here are your hosts, Phillies PA announcer Dan Baker and Mickey Morandini. We are back on the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session, live from Chickie and Pete's in Glassboro, New Jersey. The Independence Blue Cross Bull Session here today. Milt Thompson, our special guest, and our special, special co-host, Mr. Mickey Morandini. Mickey, it's now time for the Independence Blue Cross Live Fearless Player of the Week. Each week during the Philly season, we'll name a different Independence Blue Cross Live Fearless Player of the Week. This week's Live Fearless Player of the Week is none other than Bryson Stott. 
18 multi-hit games this year. Live Fearless Player of the Week is start living fearless today by going to www.ibx.com. All right? Do you have a problem with Bryson Stott? I have no problem with Bryson <laughs> Stott. I mean, he's, 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 he's a complete player right now. He's hitting the ball. He's hitting some home runs. He's getting on base. He works the count as, as good as anybody. Um, and he's playing good defense. So, yeah, that's a good choice. No, he's also a very good two-strike hitter. And, and that, that, that's an art today, is it not? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. His, his approach is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, he, he battles, he battles and battles. You know, he gets two strikes on him, and, you know, he battles that fastball, fouls it off. He does whatever he can do until he gets a pitch he can handle and, and puts it in play. And usually it, he gets a hit out of it. That's, that's, that's uh, work, hard work. <laughs> that's there's hard two, work. There's two things you used to do when we played. I know we always go back to when that's we played. That's all right. That, that was but, a better game then. But you either spread out with two strikes or you choked up. You know, and, and Bryson, he spreads out, and he sees the ball as long as he can, and he's done a great job with two strikes. Mickey, you made the point that going from shortstop to second base is not an easy transition. Tell us about how difficult that is. Well, from the, from the point of turning double plays, it's not. Obviously, it's a shorter throw. Uh, you know, you can make some plays at second where you can dive and throw a runner out where you can at shortstop. But turning a double play, having your back to that runner, not knowing where he is, now it's a little different again today because they can't take you out. They have to slide directly in the base. Now, when I played, those were some guys coming after me wanted to shoot me in the left field. But, yeah, it's a little bit different turning that double play. It's all about footwork and, and knowing where you're at and how quickly you've got to get rid of that baseball. And he's done, he's done a really good job. Uh, when you look at a guy like Bryson Stott, Phillies have had some difficulty with first-round picks. But certainly Stott and Bohm have filled the bill. and that, That's a plus for the Phillies scouting department. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Those kids. And, you know, the key to the Phillies being successful, you know, back in, in, in 2008, you know, you look at the guys who came up through the system. Right. Chase, Chase Utley. Jimmy Rollins, Ryan Howard, Chooch, you know, Ruiz, Hamels, Hamels um, Myers, yeah. Bird. All these guys came up through the system, you know, and that's, and, and that's very important. Their minor league system, you ha have to feed the minor league system, and then you can go out and get those pieces that you need, you know, to help you win a championship. Do you believe that good minor league system, a player and a half every year pushing the guy who's on the big league level, you either trade that prospect away or you trade that veteran player and maybe get something in return. Do you believe in that philosophy? Well, all you have to do is look at Montreal <laughs> back then. They, when guys came with the free agency, they're like, see you later. <laughs> and always had somebody coming up through the system, whether it be Vlad Guerrero. I mean, it was unbelievable the, the talent they had in their minor league system. And it, it's very important, you know. They push, they push one another. You know, they're going to push the guy in the big leagues, and, you know, that kid's ready when that opportunity comes about. I think competition, I love the competition. It brought out the best of me. You know, you know who's good at developing talent? The Tampa Bay Rays. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think they said Eflin just signed the biggest contract. 40 million. Yeah. 40 million. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that says something right there. They're really good. They really know how to develop pitchers. They're off the charts with developing pitchers, and that's why they got off to such a hot, hot start this year. They were like what, 15 and two or something. Yep. And, um, they're in a. How about that division? They're all above 500. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Tampa's got like they're like 17 games over 500, and only have like a three-game lead. So that division's really good. How about the Orioles this year? <laughs> yeah, they've been great. I mean, the Orioles. You got the Yankees. <laughs> Red Sox. Red Sox. Good. I mean, you could possibly see all four of the five teams in the postseason this year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, th that division is well, really. The, the Central's awful in the American League. Yep. And the, the, the West, West is doing okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, I think the, um, uh, who's in first there? Uh, the Rangers. Rangers. They're right. surprising some people. They're playing good baseball. Bochy came in there yeah. and. Oh, you yeah. know, it's amazing what a good manager can do to a team, right? You, you know, it's amazing. I had the opportunity when I worked in San Diego to spend a lot of time with Bochi. And Bochi knows how to handle players. He really does. He gets the most out of players. I mean, he's how to use a bullpen, too. 
I mean, uh, you know, again, it's an art, but you need the horses out there in the bullpen and as they well. They lost their horse already, right. Degrom. So yeah. yeah, that's pretty pretty impressive what yeah. they're doing out there. It, it, it's uh, what has surprised you guys the most about this season so far, uh, away from the Phillies, Oakland. I can't believe a team struggling that bad yeah. at this time, a major league ball club. You know, it's amazing. The Oakland A's were once the Philadelphia A's, as you guys know. They sold off players in the teens. They sold off teams in the late 20s and early 30s, right? They went to Oakland. They sold off Catfish Hunter, Vida Blue, all those guys. Reggie Jackson. Reggie Jackson. They got rid of all those. This, this franchise has believed in just selling off players because they feel as though they're not competitive because they have a terrible stadium. But I think baseball's got to step in and say, we cannot allow this to happen because they are awful baseball oh, team. team. I think the two, two teams that surprised me the most are the Padres are struggling. I mean, they got an ungodly amount of talent in that team. And the Cardinals. Uh, the Cardinals are usually, you know, steady. They're always above 500 in the mix. Um, they're starting to play better now, but they were about 12 or 13 games under 500 not too long ago, not playing very good baseball. So I think those two are pretty big surprises for me. And the Cardinals are another team that system has always been pretty good. Yeah. They've always brought up good young players, and they produce. And I, I'm really surprised that they got off to a bad start, but their starting pitching, pitching. was rather shaky at yeah. the outset. You need that starting pitching. Yes. No question. <laughs> I, I think, you know, most clubs have to go seven, eight, nine starters during the course of a year. Oh, no question. Because, you know, the, the way they baby the kids today in the minor leagues, and, and, and that, that's what bothers me. I mean, your starting pitchers, this thing about quality starts blows my mind. You give six, six innings, you have a 4.5 ERA. Six innings, that's a quality start. Quality start, in my opinion, is eight innings. You agree, Milton, Nicky? I would say seven. All I right. think if okay. you go seven innings, give yeah. up three runs or less, I think that's a quality start. Okay. Um, eight's a really good start, obviously. Um, but I would say seven with three runs, I think that's that, you've done your job. That was our formula in 2008. Get seven innings, you got Matson, and you got Lidge, and you got Romero. And you got that offense. <laughs> yes, they're probably going to score more than three runs. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that was the that was it. You know, you give us. You know, you had Cole who was giving you more than seven innings usually, but you know, the rest of the guys, you get about good six seven innings. Game's over. Well, you guys played on the '93 team, and that was a kind of special team. I mean, that that team had that great one year. You look back and say. Could we have done more over the next couple of years? What do you think happened in 94 and things started come, the wheels started coming off? Our health. Yeah, yeah. injuries. Dalton and Dykstra were out early for yeah. a lot of the year. And right. Our health wasn't very good. But, you know, 93, we just put everything together. We had career years out of, you know, six or seven guys. But what, what really got us, I think, our offense was off the charts. But our starting pitching, nobody realized. We, had, we had, Everybody had at least 12 wins that year. You're yeah. not, you don't see that anymore. No. You don't see five starters with 12 wins on every team. And, you know, Mal Holland and Danny Jackson and Schilling, you had to pry that ball out of their hand to get them out of a ball game. They were, they were special that year. Yeah. Was Schilling the most intense competitor on the hill that you guys have been around? As, you know, I mean, you've seen a lot of great pitchers over the years, but Schilling was a special animal, especially in big games. I he, think as a teammate, yeah. he definitely was. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, if you ask who was the leader on the pitching mound on that team that year, I would say Moholland. Moholland, yes. Moholland was. And I think Schilling got, you know, once his years got on, he got better, he became a very dominant pitcher and one of the best pitchers in baseball. But if you want to ask me what was one of the coolest things about 93, we had three platoons. Unselfish team. You know, me and, me and Inky in left field put our numbers together. We got some good numbers. Go right field and you go West Chamberlain and Eisenreich. Put those numbers together, you got real good numbers. Mickey and Donkey, put those numbers together. Unbelievable numbers. And plus, you know, the days we weren't starting, we were ready if we had to right. come off the bench with a, with, a, with a key hit. To be a bench player right now, <laughs> good luck. 
th- that's a good point because Rio Muto wants to play every game. And I think, look, he pitched, uh, caught over 300 innings more than any catcher in baseball. Eventually, he's 31 years old. It's going to take its toll. You know, I think you give him a blow every couple, you know, four or five days because you're going to wear him out, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, there's a lot more off days in the big leagues now right. than there used to be when we played. And uh, I mean, he's 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 a good player. He's like Dutch. Dutch didn't want to have take any days off either. I remember he'd play a. 12-inning, 13-inning Saturday night game and come in Sunday and his name wasn't up there. Todd Pratt was up there and he'd go right into Fergosi's office and said, I'm fine, I'm playing, and Vuk would come out and change the lineup. I mean, Rio Muto has that type of mentality. And you got to like that. you got to like that about a guy. What do you think of Rio Muto calling the game? I mean, you guys have been around the game a long time. you like the way he sets up the pitchers? I know one thing. He is unbelievable throwing out <laughs> Yeah, guy stealing. That's the one thing that he saves pitchers with. I mean, he is unbelievable back there, you know, getting rid of that ball, and it's, it's precise almost every single time. You know, that, that, helps, that helps out tremendously. Why is it that pitchers don't do a better job holding runners on base? Doesn't matter anymore. Well, jeez. <laughs> well, it really doesn't. You know, you just said throw hard as you can. If you're trying to throw hard as you can, you ain't thinking about it anything else but just rearing back and trying to throw the ball as hard as you can. I mean, I faced a lot of pitchers that didn't. Greg Maddox didn't care if you stole on him. Right. He had a high leg kick every time. You could, Because he knew he could get the, the next guy out. There were a lot of guys. I don't think the it has changed that much where, where pitchers, you know, don't, don't worry about guys stealing base. I think that has stayed pretty consistent. All right. We got to take a quick break. We're on the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session live from Chicky and Pete's in Glassboro, New Jersey. Our special guest, Milt Thompson. Our great, great co-host today, Mickey Morandini. We'll be right back after these messages. At Independence Blue Cross, we believe in giving you the tools you need to pursue your healthiest life. From premiums as low as $0 per month to health discounts and cash rewards, it pays to have coverage with Independence. With the strongest network of doctors and hospitals in the region and free 24-7 virtual doctor visits, you can feel confident that quality care is always within reach. Learn more about your coverage options at ibx.com. If you're looking for a stylish and sophisticated fine dining experience, visit your Eddie V's Prime Seafood Restaurant in near King of Prussia. Eddie V's Seafood features an abundant selection of fine wines and curated cocktails to complement exquisite steaks and seafood made from the highest quality ingredients. In the V Lounge, sip on imaginative handcrafted cocktails with attitude while enjoying signature appetizers. Conveniently located between I-276 and I-76 near the King of Prussia Mall. Call them today, 610-337-7823 to schedule your night out for Eddie V's Prime Prime Seafood. A truly unique dining experience awaits you at Fogo de Show. Fogo de Show awes patrons with their history and tradition of authentic Brazilian steakhouse, offering many cuts of decadent fire roasted meats prepared over an open fire and served tableside by trained gaucho chefs. Fogo de Show, 1337 Chestnut Street in Center City, Philadelphia. For reservations, go to www.fogo.com or call 215 636 9700. SEPTA offers a variety of career opportunities. Our core business is transit, and with five modes of service, we rely on and need operators, engineers, and conductors. But it takes a host of other specialties, including mechanics, electricians, plumbers, masons, painters, carpenters, welders, and more to keep the system moving. As an employee, you will earn competitive compensation and great benefits, including medical, dental, prescription, and a pension. Visit jobs.septa.org to apply today. That's jobs.septa.org. During the Toyota Ready, Set, Go sales event, just imagine yourself in a new Toyota. Whatever you need, from an electric vehicle to a rugged, versatile truck, we have new Toyotas on the ground for immediate delivery. Or choose from over 100 certified used options, which undergo a rigorous inspection and include an amazing warranty. Plus service centers that can save you time and money and keep you on the road. So let's go to Team Toyota this spring. Just visit teamtoyota.net to find a location near you. We now return to the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session. Once again, here are your hosts, Phillies PA announcer Dan Baker and Mickey Morandini. We are back at Chickie and Pete's in Glassboro, New Jersey for another edition of the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session. I'm Bill Warrendale, filling in for the great Dan Baker. 
course, Mickey Morandini is our special co-host, along with our special guest, Milt Thompson. Now, next week, a noon start at Chickie and Pete's. Dan Baker's special co-host will be former Phil Gary Matthews. They're working on a very, very special guest, but I cannot open the envelope because I've been sworn to secrecy, all right? <laughs> sworn to secrecy, all right? But they're going to have a very special guest next week at Chickie and Pete's. 15th and Packer, Gary Matthews, the special co-host, a 12 noon kickoff. So we got a lot of things to do. All right? All right, guys, when we uh, resume play on t- – what do you think about not playing on Memorial Day? <laughs> I just saw- I was shocked because we, we've yeah. always played on Memorial Day. I just saw July Larry 4th. Bowie yesterday, and he goes, right. he can't ever remember when you didn't play on Memorial Day. Oh, yeah. No. I mean, Memorial Day, July 4th, and Labor Day were always, a lot of times when I was growing up, they were double headers on those days. <laughs> well, uh, once again, it's a changing. different time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, you can't blame that on the players. No. no. That's no. not a player, no. player thing. But it, it's interesting they're not playing today. Yeah. But, again, they're, they're catching the Mets right now, and they're, they're struggling the Mets. You know, they, they went on a little bit of a roll, but they've, come back to earth, and they're depending on two ancient pitchers in Verlander and Scherzer. Can they hold up for the long haul? What do you think, Mickey? I don't know if I would have given Verlander $40 million. I know he's a great pitcher, but he's 40 years old, and he's got a lot of bullets in that arm. Um, he's struggling a little bit. Scherzer's okay. He's not the Scherzer of five, six, seven years ago, but um, I think if they're going to depend on those two to get them to a playoff spot, I think they're going to be highly disappointed. And, of course, they lost their closer, Diaz. Yep. Yeah. That was a big, big loss in the WBC. What do you guys think of the WBC? I, I don't like it. I think if they're going to play it, play it the All-Star break. That's when yeah. I would play it. Yeah, I mean, you coming in spring training, you're not ready to play. So it's, it's, it's really t- tough. And uh, going back to the Mets – how many guys have you seen go to the Mets later in their career and really do something positive? Yeah, that's right. Bonilla, Foster, <laughs> Coleman. <laughs> uh, Bonilla still gets paid. On on. Yes, right. <laughs> the list goes on and on and yeah. on and on. That, you know, guys come there late and it's nothing good comes out of it. <laughs> Mickey and, and Milt, can you buy a championship? I mean, I, 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 I have a tough time when Steinbrenner used to try to do it. And then when he listened to his baseball people, he developed players. You can't really buy a championship. I know Cohen's got more money than anybody in, in baseball, but you can't buy a championship, can you? I think if you look at most of the teams that have won World Series in the last 15, 20 years, they have a lot of players that came up through the system. Even the Astros last yeah. year, they had a lot of good young talent on that team that came up through the system. And um, So, no, I don't, I don't think – uh, you have to pick your spots um, on when you need to go out and, and make a big purchase, and I don't think you can, you can buy a championship. And the chemistry is very important. I mean, people kind of downplay that, but you have to feel comfortable with the guy next to you, don't you? Well, that's the important part of building, building your system, bringing, building your, your team through your system, because those kids have been through the grind together. You know, bus rides, all those things, you know, and they grow together. And it, it's very important, just like Mickey said. Look at that list of guys who came through the system with the Astros. It's practically their whole team. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's, it's incredible. Especially now, Mickey, their pitching. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you came up through the, the Philly yeah. system. What was it like back then? Uh, you wanted to get to the big leagues as fast as you could. I know that. I, you know, I mean, you got paid very minimally, um, and the bus rides were long bus rides, and uh, you didn't have many off days. You didn't make a lot of money. Um, you had to buy your own batch. You had to buy your own cleats. You had, you know, you you didn't have anything given to you back in the day. It, it's changing a little bit now for the good, but um, you wanted to get to the big leagues as fast as you can, and 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 you know, let them know you uh, you could play at that level. Especially, nope. especially spring training. Right. <laughs> the yeah. Philly run will get you every year. You, you definitely don't want to be down there and have to do that Philly run as a young kid. <laughs> now, now, you started out in the, uh, the Atlanta system, yes. right? What was that like? I mean. Um, it was a tough system. I mean, it, at that time, we, we weren't very good, so we got a lot of um, early picks. And that's how we 
developed our system. They did a great job of drafting. And, you know, I think it was 14 years in a row they went to the playoffs, <laughs> you know, yeah. after that. But, you know, we had a great system and had great coaches. They you know. had some real good coaches oh, yeah. there. What was Bobby Cox like? I mean, you were around Bobby a lot. Bobby's unbelievable. You know, um, I'll tell you a quick story about myself and Bobby Cox. In, in 1984, I was up in the big leagues when I first came up, hit 300, everything went well. Um, they got rid of uh, Tory in the offseason, and they, they hired uh, Chuck Tanner. And it was crazy because Bobby Cox was a GM. And Tanner goes, well, if I can get me some, uh, some good young, I mean, good veterans in here, Thompson can stand another year in the minor leagues. I was like, whoa, what did I do for that? So I, I called Bobby Cox and asked for a meeting for lunch, and he agreed. We had lunch, and I'm like, Bobby, are you going to try to tell me I'm not one of the 25 guys? I shouldn't be one of the 20. He goes, I don't make the team. He goes, the manager makes the team. You know, I make suggestions, but the manager is the one who makes his team. He goes, I'll tell you what i do for you. I'll get your name out there and see if there's any takers. And that's how I got over here to Philly. Really? Wow. Yes. Jeez. That's an amazing story. It's incredible. Yep. Me and Bedrosian. But you, 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 you didn't play for Bobby, did you? Uh, no, I didn't play for Bobby. Yeah. He was the GM at the time. What was Tory like? To... Tory was, Tory was very quiet you know general but you know everybody respected him he knew the game of baseball and it was fun um one of the tougher guys on our team was our pitching coach by the name of bob gibson bob gibson Ooh. <laughs> mean dude <laughs> bob gibson <laughs> bob gibson said to a batter one time if you're digging in dig the the hole deep enough so you can bury yourself in it <laughs> because <laughs> well this is what he say he says Half of the plate belongs to me. Half of the plate belongs to you. You just don't know what half belongs to me. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, he, he was, he was, he was a, mean. He was a mean dude, yeah, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> he was a tough hombre, I'm telling yes. you. I mean, we lost him a couple of years ago, but he, he was a great pitcher. You know, coming up this will, a couple of weeks will be the Phillies will salute Dick Allen. And I think that the Phillies and many people got to get behind Dick Allen for the Hall of Fame because – if you talk of one guy who went through an awful lot in Philadelphia and put up numbers that are up there with Aaron and Mays and people like that in a 10-year period, it's unfortunate he's not in the Hall of Fame. And I question the voting of the golden era. One vote. Twice. <laughs> and nobody one knows vote. who that won, how he lost. No, that, 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 that voting is not revealed to the public, which is, I think is un, very unfair. You guys agree? Definitely agree. I mean, if you're going to put your name to something and say why a person shouldn't be there, mm -hmm. you need to you need to answer for that. Um, fortunate enough, next year, uh, next week, I'm going to be over for the for the field, for the you know dedicating the field to in his name over right. there at FDR. I said to Mike Schmidt one time, he was the greatest offensive player I ever saw in a Phillies uniform. And that's dating like 60 some years, but you know Mike was the greatest all around player. But Allen was unbelievable. All right, guys, we've got to put a wrap on this show. Uh, from Chickie and Pete's in Glassboro, New Jersey, uh, the Independence Blue Cross Bull Session. Our special guest was Mill Thompson. Our great, great co-host today was Mickey Morandini. Got to thank Fogo the Shal, Ventresca, and Eddie V's promotional consideration. Now, remember, next week, 15th and Packer, Chickie and Pete's, Gary Matthews is Dan Baker's special guest. 12 noon kick, and it will have a very, very special guest. Until next week on the Bull Session, I'm Bill Warndell. See you later. <laughs>